Hello, I'd like to uh, address the issues to do with this Ellen DeGeneres show. As you probably know, the, there's been an accusation that it's a, a toxic work environment, even though she presents herself as the, the be kind lady. Now, um, I'm not actually going to address so much the story around Ellen DeGeneres, but it's more like how are people reacting to Ellen DeGeneres and, and what does it tell us about power and the abuse of power and what does it tell us about how we maybe abuse power sometimes too. Look at some ideas and issues around that that can be interesting to explore. But just briefly, the responses so far have been interesting in that um, looking at the apology that Ellen did in the first show of her new series, there's been a lot of criticism of that, saying it was not really an apology and having looked at it, I think people do have a point there. So the video has had, she's had about about over 2 million views and about 40,000 likes and about something in the region of 90,000 dislikes. So there's over a 2 to 1 ratio of dislikes to likes. So there's a lot more dislikes than likes. And looking at the actual comments people are writing there, it was very much also along the lines of dislikes and not convinced by the apology. And, and there's a kind of wide spectrum there of people who really just want to cancel her show or people who want to replace with somebody else. The thing about wanting to cancel the show is if somebody's genuine concern, if somebody's genuinely concerned about her staff, and she's supposed to have nearly, nearly 300 staff or something like that, and if somebody's genuinely concerned about the well-being of her staff, then surely they won't be asking for the show to be cancelled because the staff will lose their jobs. As I say, the, the issue that's being held up in front of us, the underlying issue behind the, the events are the misuse of power, claiming that she has a power and authority over people and it's being abused in various ways. So the thing is though, we need to be careful in dealing with these types of things because it's very easy for us to then drift into to abusing our power and misusing our power in some way because although most of us don't have much power in this situation, we can like, we can dislike, we can make comments and nowadays that has an effect. So accumulatively it has an effect. And there's people putting up YouTube videos which are understandably very critical of the apology, which wasn't really an apology. So that's understandable. But we need to be careful that we don't, you know, overreact and overdo it. And the problem is, when we all club together and sort of get a bit mobbish about it, it can be easy. It can be too easy for us to push things too far. And um, and so, if we're really looking for the moral high ground, then the moral high ground is going to be more interested in justice than vengeance because some people are just out for vengeance some people it seems to me from the comment just don't like Ellen DeGeneres and I've never liked her I now have a, having a chance to have a go at her so that's not the moral high ground either and that's not really a good use of power just to kicking somebody when you when they're down or when you think they're going to go down so I'm not convinced that some of these comments that are being made and also in themselves abuses of power, be it that it's a small power, but still, it's still in a sense on a small scale an abuse of power. And if we abuse power on the small scale, there's always a chance that when we get more power, we'll, we'll abuse it on the large scale. What is the moral high ground? How can each of us find that for ourselves, what that is? Because obviously it's an individual choice and it's an individual thing. So here are some questions that I think that can be really interesting and useful to ask ourselves when dealing with these kind of situations and to help us na navigate through them in a holistic and compassionate way. Well, it's down to about four questions. Am I out for vengeance or am I out for justice? Because vengeance looks very different from justice and sometimes there can be a bit of overlap but sometimes it's a nuanced thing that we can we can change how we respond in a way where we're um, we're more interested in the justice side rather than you know as I say kicking somebody when they're down or having a go at somebody we don't like and because they're perfectly entitled to be somebody we don't like and we're perfectly entitled to not like them but that doesn't mean we need to beat them down the first chance we get because they might not be a bad person because most people are mixed or or a mix of good and bad and um, so on one hand we want justice but where's the point where that starts to tip over into, into vengeance so that's something to watch out for and another question to ask ourselves well is my intention to help or to hurt 
and, you know, so like if I'm making a comment on a, on, on a video or something, am I out to help or am I out to hurt? What's my intention? What am I trying to achieve? What am I trying to do? Another good question is, am I out to liberate or to dominate? In other words, am I, am I out to offer something that's useful, insightful, informative about the situation? Or am I out to manipulate and control the event for my own ends? And, and I think this is a good question for a lot of YouTubers to ask themselves that, or the way they're handling the situation. Are they just playing it to, to, for their own ends or are they actually making a, a positive contribution overall to the situation? And also for us, and how we respond, what's the, what's the feeling that comes up? Is that feeling of, of wanting to liberate uh, and to enliven the situation, to put, in a boot, put the boot in, to, put, to have our say in a way that is not constructive and not helpful. A knee-jerk reaction, wanting vengeance or wanting to hurt somebody we don't like, and it ties into the previous questions as well. Another good one, it's an interesting one, is, is my intention to elevate or to escalate? So a fun way of thinking about it is, am I an elevator <laughs> or, am I an, or am I an escalator? Am I um, fueling the flame, is pouring fuel on the fire, adding to the drama, adding to the angst, adding to the pain in the situation? Am I adding in to the angry, frustrated, uh, judgmental reaction? Or am I offering something that, that elevates the situation? So justice can be done, but uh, not through kind of mob, <laughs> mob emotional violence or mob social violence. So the situation gets elevated rather than just gets escalated into more drama and more angst. Part of this, I think, is judgmentalism. It can be very tempting and very easy to judge other people, especially if somebody we've never really liked that much anyway. And a lot of the criticisms made of Ellen DeGeneres is, is a bit fake, is the most common uh, accusation made against her, and um, that I've seen anyway. And um, I've, I've never watched a whole show of it. Ellen DeGeneres and her style has never really grabbed me and never really appealed particularly, but um, there are, presumably there are people it does appeal to and, and we all know that to some extent everybody's fake on TV, but, but her presenting herself as the be kind lady, she in a way set herself up to be heavily criticised when it turned out that the organisation behind her and the way her, her uh, organisation is run is kind of toxic and so can a person really use power to the full and be kind. You know, I think that in a way is the crux of the matter is that she chose to use that as her banner and headline or her catchphrase. Because as soon as somebody sets themselves up as I'm the be kind person or I'm this or I'm that, what happens to the other parts of them that are not like that? What's going to tend to happen is the unkind parts are going to get repressed when she's on camera, when she's on TV or when she's in certain situations. Uh, or dealing with, with um, the people she's hosting, to some extent she's going to be pushing down the unkind parts. And when are they going to come out? <laughs> it reminds me when I was a kid, and then on our boy were, were playing around with this like underground stream that was coming up uh, uh, into the surface. And we, we it's a very, it was a very small stream and we, we blocked it with a few rocks and then it would pop up somewhere else. And we blocked that bit and then it would pop up somewhere else. And, Every time we tried to block this thing, within a few seconds, or certainly within a minute, it would certainly be popping up somewhere else. So I think that's what happens when somebody decides, okay, I'm going to be kind and I'm going to push down the parts that are not kind, then it's going to erupt somewhere, it's going to come out somewhere. And then if that kind of spills out into the culture, where it becomes a be kind culture, to decide that, oh, this organization, we're all going to be kind and we're all going to be happy and or whatever it was. And I believe some of that has been part of the organizational culture. That just represses the whole thing as well. It's much better to bring in some form of like um, conflict resolution is a far better way of making sure people are going to be kind and be happy in the workplace rather than just making a decision that this is how it's going to be and this coming from the top and being imposed. So we can't really impose kindness on people. That's a form of autocracy, that's a form of, it's an imposition, it's the dictatorship, it's trying to force something rather than letting it develop naturally and surely something like kindness needs to, which is a heart quality, needs to be cultivated, you can't force it, 
we can't use willpower to create love. We can use willpower to create an environment that encourages the development of love, but we can't force love by an act of will. <laughs> I'm going to be loving, or I'm going to be kind, and you're going to be kind, and we're all going to be kind. It does not work like that. So it sounds like it was a really dysfunctional uh, setup, you know, to the extent that that's what they're trying to do, trying to force something that can only come through a natural process and creating a culture that supports it and not trying to force it on people. And as I say, by also having part of the organizational culture where conflicts can be resolved, that they can be dealt with, which means they need to be able to be surfaced and they need to be honestly faced and the underlying issues behind those conflicts need to be able to surface as well and they have to be dealt with in a real way. I tend to go along with people who say that the apology wasn't really an apology uh, without being down in the women because I think that was a very artificial situation to try and do a, an apology like that in public on TV is very awkward in a way but also dangerous legally because anything that she acknowledges too clearly and specifically in a public apology can then be used possibly to sue her possibly to sue the company it probably took <laughs> some certain amount of legal advice in order to construct that apology. So I think there was a legal element to the, how that apology was worded and how it was carefully avoiding uh, no acknowledgement of, of error. If I hurt people then I'm sorry isn't really a, an apology and that's effectively partly what she said. What people are saying is no if she's saying she did so that's what's really annoying people. So, um, But yeah so I think but the real apology needs to be made to the staff. So there's many things she got wrong with the apology and um, like the the promotion of a member of staff during the show on, on TV like that was was just, I don't know, making too many jokes and all of this kind of thing. It all felt just kind of not really right. So it just, so that was, I think, I think that was very unfortunate that she did it that way. So th this leads us to what does an apology look like? A proper apology is when we acknowledge what we did and we acknowledge the effect that it has on, on, on the other person. I think if those two elements are there, then it's a much better chance of being a solid apology. First of all, obviously, we need to acknowledge what we did that, that troubled them. Maybe we might say something like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry I, sh I shouted at you and insulted you. Then, you know, that's, that's the beginnings. That's a good step forward in the way of an apology. To acknowledge what we did very specifically. And but what I think was even better, which takes it to the next level, is so if we can acknowledge how the other person felt, or ask them how they felt, and then acknowledge how they felt. So, for example, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I shouted at you and called you names. That must have been really hurtful, and you know, I guess you felt terrible about that, and and it's made you really angry and upset. And it was at a time when you were feeling quite vulnerable, so I feel really bad about that, and. So basically, to really connect with the other person's experience of the situation, to really acknowledge the impact of what we did on the other person. And what's good about that is that it's showing empathy. And if we have empathy for somebody and empathy for a situation where we've hurt somebody and empathy for how they felt about it, then we're less likely to do it again. And usually when somebody just goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but doesn't connect with the other person's feelings, they're in their own feelings, they're in their guilt or their fear of being punished or whatever it is, but they're in their own feelings. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you can't really be sure they're not going to do it again if it's a knee-jerk apology. And the other side of that is that sometimes people are too sensitive and they react to things where we meant no harm whatsoever. It's like the equivalent of uh, having a say for example somebody had a bruise on their arm under the sleeve and we didn't know it was there we we accidentally bumped their arm or touched their arm and they went oh you know and that was really sore or they had a, maybe a, a cut under there with a bandage on it and that was really sore we caused them pain in a sense but it was totally unintentional and so often emotional bruises and emotional wounds are, are are invisible to us or unless we kind of know the person well and it can be easy to come out with something that really is hurtful to somebody but the the propensity to pain in that situation was already there. We, we didn't cause it. We weren't out to hurt. We were just doing or saying something and we, we hurt them. And that can be a tricky one because to a certain extent, it just sometimes just helps just to apologize and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I, was, you know, I had no idea you were going to be so affected by it and to acknowledge it that way. 
it's a tricky one sometimes because um, if somebody keeps doing that, if somebody keeps playing a, a painful story and we did not create it and we did not intend to hurt them, then we're beginning to become a hostage and it reaches a point where we're starting to have to change our behaviour because we're becoming a hostage to the pain they had in the past. We don't want to become a hostage to the pain that somebody experienced in the past. So it's important that, that they clear up that issue and not be constantly triggered by it. So that's another side of it too. That So we can apologise, but sometimes they need to address the issue. They need to address the underlying issue. See, the thing about um, trying to push ourselves to be like be kind or be loving or be compassionate. I mean, obviously we can cultivate these feelings. Some of the reasons why it's not good to try and force that too hard is what happens with our anger? What happens to our resentment? What happens to our frustration? Where does all of that go? We're not being kind to those aspects of ourselves if we're pushing them away and they don't have a home. So if there's no home for our anger or resentment or a bitterness or what have you, where do they go? And as I say, they just go underground and they come out in strange ways. But they're part of our nature and they're rare to be redeemed and transformed. Because anger is not just a negative thing. It's even bitterness and resentment are not necessarily negative things. They're all signs that there's been a boundary issue or something is not functioning the way we would like to, to be in our life or in that situation. So we can transform like things like anger into right action. And maybe we need to be more bold in our action and look at where our boundaries are being overstepped and what we need to do about it. So we need to allow those parts of us to have a home because if we just push them away, that's being unkind. That's lacking compassion. That's lacking love. Because if we can't love those aspects of ourselves, create a harmonious relationship with them and look to how to integrate them and make them part of ourselves in a constructive way, then we can't do that with other people who are expressing the same feelings either. And sometimes we need to be kind and compassionate to, to other people that are being angry, other people that are being bitter, or other people that are being fr feeling frustrated. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't work, just to try too hard to be kind or to be nice or what have you. So we need to be careful how we approach these things and by all means cultivate these finer feelings, but not push them and not force them. So this video has gone on a bit longer than I, than I expected to do, so I'm going to stop now. But anyway, I hope you found it interesting and useful. Please do the usual things of subscribing, liking, and so on and so forth. Blessings on you and on your journey in life. Thank you.